which you can find on page 1074. John 18 from verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Then turn, turn to John 21, a few pages over, reading from verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the, the, the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it. And, they, and now they were not able to haul it, haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, that, that disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, "It is the Lord." When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went, ab went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had revealed to the, was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after this he said to him, 
follow me. So far the reading. might read the rest of the verses of that chapter because we'll come to them later. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against them during the supper and had said, Lord, who uh, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad amongst the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose, that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. I mean, so as providence would have it, uh, this is the third sermon that we're having from the Apostle John, uh, the the, uh, Epistle of John, sorry, the Gospel of John uh, this weekend. Um, And after Jesus is risen, uh, we have these number of little scenes. One, the first with Mary Magdalene that we heard about this morning. And then... um, uh, Jesus' interactions with Thomas towards the end of chapter 20. And now uh, we are going to look at um, Jesus' interactions with the Apostle Peter in uh, chapter 21. Before we do that, let's pause again and ask uh, God to bless his word to us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of our risen Lord and ask you to open our minds, uh, open our hearts, open our spirits and open your word uh, to us. We thank you for this very great privilege and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The presence of the Lord Jesus alive after the resurrection, uh, just as he had promised, transforms everything. And we can see this very clearly in the disobedience of Peter, the fall of Peter, and in his restoration after the resurrection of Jesus. So our text for this afternoon is going to be uh, two small passages from uh, the chapters that we've read. First from John 18, 18. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. And then uh, over, over the page to John 21, verses 8 to 10. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. When they got uh, out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. These two little passages both have a charcoal fire. They're uh, just a a few pages apart. And the Greek word for charcoal fire is identical. In Thracian, we get anthracite coal from that Greek word. So the words for the charcoal fires are identical. Now, the Apostle John is a very careful and deliberate writer. In the contrast that is built here is no accident. You have a charcoal fire, and a couple of pages pages later, another charcoal fire. And then, if you start looking for other similarities or sharp contrasts, you rapidly find them. We have been invited by John to compare and contrast the two settings. The first fire was built by the enemies of Christ. The second fire was built by Christ himself. Peter was present in both instances. And he was present because of something that had been said by the Apostle John. So it was John who said in the boat, it is the Lord. 
And Peter throws himself in the water to get to the shore. And John uh, was the one who spoke the word to the servant girl back in chapter 18, who got Peter admittance so that he could stand by the first coal fire. Jesus was present in both settings. In the first, he was on trial for his life. And in the second, uh, he had conquered death. In the first, Peter denied the Lord three times, just as Jesus had predicted that he would, and he fell into sin. In the second, he affirmed his love for Jesus three times. He denies Jesus three times around the first coal fire, and he affirms his love for Jesus three times around the second. He affirms his love for Jesus more humbly than he used to. Before, he would say things like, if everyone else forsakes you, I will not. And Jesus then predicts that he's going to deny him. Jesus predicts that he's going to fall after Peter has affirmed how much he loved Jesus. If everybody else proves to be a skunk, I will not be a skunk. Here in this passage, in this affirmation, Peter is much more humble. There are different words for love in Greek, uh, there's agape love and there is phileo. Uh, phileo is warm brotherly affection. Agape is a sort of self-sacrificial love. So Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. Peter, do you agape me? Lord, you know I phileo you. Peter is much more humble in his profession of love. Lord, you know that you're the best friend I ever had. You, you know that. I have a warm affection for you. You know that. But he's not going to say anything like, if everyone else denies you, if everyone forsakes agape love, I'm going to be the one person who stands true. Now he's humble. Around the first charcoal fire, Peter receives something from wicked men, warmth. And in the second, he receives something from the Lord Jesus, food and forgiveness, food and forgiveness. In the first, Peter does not compare favorably with the Apostle John. Uh, John was more influential at court. He's the one who got Peter in. John didn't deny the Lord, and John didn't run away. In the second, Peter has all such comparisons put to rest for him. In John 21, uh, verses 21 and 22, what is that, uh, he, Jesus says, what is that to you? You follow me. Uh, Peter had said in that second, second instance, what about this man pointing to John? And Jesus said, never mind, John, you follow me. So you can see that it's not just the two coal fires. Why the two coal fires? Uh, someone could say, well, because that's what they used for heat back then, right? Don't um, over-explain, but if there is a literary device going on here, and we can be confident that there is, you can look for other parallels and contrasts and find a cluster of them. Coal fire, coal fire. Enemies of Christ, friends of Christ. You find three denials, you find three affirmations. You have comparisons between John and Peter, and uh, you have comparisons between John and Peter. So basically, this, this is served up to us with arrows pointing at it. Pay attention to this. Well, there's something else. In verse 5, the fishermen are coming in. The fishermen would fish at night because that's when the fish would be close to the surface. And the buyers of fish, merchants uh, who want to buy a catch, would come to the shore and ask, any luck, boys? How'd you get on? So Jesus calls out, did you catch anything? And that itself was not unusual. And then something follows that is unusual. He says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And they cast. And then Jesus later says in verse 10, drag, drag this net in. Bring the fish here. And Jesus is making a point about the fish. He's doing something 
with the fish. He's doing more than one thing, actually, and it's quite remarkable what happens. They count the fish, and that's a bit weird. Uh, there are 153 fish. So, okay, you might say, how do I apply that in my quiet time? Okay, that's my devotional verse for the day. What do I do with that? Paying attention to the number of fish caught is not a mystical or spooky reading of the text. Uh, there's a literary reading of the text. It's reading with your eyes open. It's reading with your mind and heart open. If you're going to read the Bible uh, as though it were written uh, by an intelligent men and inspired by an all-wise God, uh, you should expect remarkable things to come out. And that's what we have here. The issues are placement, foreshadowing, parallelism, conventions, and so on. Consider another detail from this text. When Jesus called out to his disciples fishing about 100 meters offshore, he told them to put their nets down over the right side of the boat, which they did. So Jesus is a rugby pitch length away, and he says from that distance from the beach, try the right side, uh, like, right, like, like he, he can see the fish from there. He told them to put their nets down on the right side of the boat, and they did that. When they'd done that, the result was this huge haul. And John immediately says to Peter, it is the Lord. This is a way of Jesus identifying himself. Uh, when he'd first called them to ministry back three years before, this was how he did it. Do you remember? Jesus called these fishermen to follow him. He'd called them to be his apostles by this means. Jesus identifies himself. This is his calling card. This is his way of saying, this is the Lord. This is, uh, when, he, when he'd first called them in ministry, he called them away from their nets, we see in Matthew 4, verses 18 to 22, so that they could become fishers of men. And when Jesus um, had done a similar miracle like this one before, the response that Peter had at that time was of being overwhelmed with his own sinfulness. Luke 5, verse 8. Jesus gives them a remarkable haul of fish, and when Peter looks at the fish, he falls down and says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, I'm a wretch. Now, the order is different. In Luke, Jesus does the miracle, and then Peter confesses that he's a wretch. Here, remember, around that first cold fire, uh, Peter had blasphemed. He had denied the Lord. Peter had cursed and sworn, I don't know the man, I have nothing to do with him. Now he didn't just feel like a wretch, he was a wretch, and he was a blustering wretch. He is someone who had said, if everyone else denies you, I'm not going to do it. And then Peter blasphemes, curses, swears, he was a wretch. And then the order is reversed. So you have, in Luke you have the hall of fish, and then Peter confesses his sinfulness. Now, Peter has wept bitterly. He confesses uh, his sinfulness, and then Jesus gives him a great haul of fish. The first time, the miracle had made him aware of his sinfulness. The second time, he was living uh, in an awareness of his sinfulness with the memory of his denials and his blasphemies still raw. And this same miracle calls him out of it. And we'll return to that in a few moments. The scene in John has a return to both elements. Jesus, first of all, deals wonderfully with Peter's sin, his fall, and his restoration. And secondly, Jesus commissions him, recommissions him to ministry as a fisher of men. He tells them three times to feed the sheep. So Peter denies the Lord three times. Peter reaffirms his love for the Lord three times, and Jesus recommissions him three times. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. We should also have no trouble seeing uh, the fish as emblematic of the coming hall at Pentecost. And we read about that this morning. The nations were about to be brought into the boat, and Jesus indeed had made his disciples fishers of men, fishers of of the nations. In this case, uh, Peter had jumped out of the boat and the others had brought the fish in. But Peter is soon to rejoin the work 
the work of fishing. We can imagine Peter standing up on a wall at Pentecost. If there are 3,000 people converted at Pentecost, there are more than that in the crowd. And when you're preaching to thousands of people, you want to stand on something taller. So we can imagine Peter standing on a wall in order to preach at Pentecost. Imagine him throwing his gospel net over the right side of the boat. That's how God works. That, that is what Jesus is up to with these fish. And Jesus makes it crystal clear that that's what he's up to. What is it with the specific number of fish? It's not just a lot of fish and big ones, or that this is a good haul and an abundance of fish means an abundance of converts. What is it with the specific number of fish, 153? Well, this is a good place for illustrating the difference between a careful literary reading of the text and a sort of mystical uh, jab your finger at the text sort of a reading. The number 153 is that a goodly amount of ingenuity spent on it has to be said. Some of it has been fanciful. Some of it has been pretty pedestrian and some of it sober. <clears throat> but the sober reading is still astonishing. The pedestrian reading is that 153 is mentioned because that's how many fish there were, darn it. Why does the Apostle John say 153? Because that's how many there were. Yes, but a curio reader asks, why bring it up at all? Why bring it up at all? How many, boat, how many oars did the boat have? Uh, what was the construction of the boat? How many masts were there? This isn't just a bit of local colour. You don't have the apostles describing the texture of the azure sky or how the wind was blowing through the grasses by the Sea of Galilee. We don't have a lot of background scenery. We don't have that sort of thing in the Gospels at all. And then you have this net hauled in, 153. A fanciful reading, a trifling reading, is when you add 10. Let's say, well, the Bible has 10 commandments. And seven, well, we have a sevenfold spirit. And if we add 10 and seven, well, why, why would we do that? That's the problem. You're just being arbitrary. Augustine urged this approach. If you add 10 commandments to seven of the sevenfold spirit, you get 17. And 153 is the triangular of 17. Now, triangular means that if you add uh, 17 to 16 to 15 to 14 and all the way down to one, you get the larger number. So if you start with 17, 16, 15, 14, all the way down, you add, add it all up, that gets you 153. So that's interesting, and we ought to file that away. But what basis do you have for saying uh, 10 commandments and sevenfold spirit? That's just sort of like saying, okay, I need to get 17 somehow, and I'm going to rummage in my Bible until I come up with, come up with it. You, you don't have to rummage. There's more to it. The problem is that you can also get 153 this way from Seventeen magazine, and that doesn't mean that John is talking about the challenges of adolescence in a secular age. This is the kind of thing that John Calvin called childish trifling. You don't want to just cherry pick. You don't want to go through the Bible and say, oh, this reminds me of, of that. Uh, and this verse reminds me of that other thing. This is not a raw shark uh, test. It's not an ink blot that you look at and it makes you think of stuff. And whatever you think of must be true because it's the word of God. That really is childish trifling. But that doesn't mean there's nothing to the numbers. That doesn't mean the numbers mean nothing. Even today, we are, we're not accustomed to this, but... Yeah, there are still certain numbers that pop out at us. If you're at the supermarket and you're making a purchase and the till comes up to $6.66, it's the sort of thing the operator might make a joke about. What did you just buy? Or 666, that looks ominous. Well, we recognize 666 right off. But 666 is also a triangular. It's the triangular of the number 36. So if you add 36 to 35 and so on, 
uh, down to 1, uh, you get 666. And 36 is 6 times 6. The biblical writers often uh, did make some of their points with numbers, and John particularly did. John did a lot. The fact that it is unusual to us doesn't make it unusual or strange uh, to them. So we, we already have solid grounds for understanding the fish as representing the Gentile nations. We have that fishes of men call that Jesus gives the apostles in the Gospels, and he gives it to Peter and Andrew and James and John. Uh, and we have the fact that throughout Scripture, the sea represents uh, the Gentiles and the land represents the Jews. Uh, so the, the land is Israel and the sea is the Gentile nations. No one in the Old Testament is shown eating fish. But in the New Testament, fishing and the eating of fish uh, becomes very prominent. You see it a lot. Now, on the day of Pentecost, how many nations are listed in Acts chapter 2? Well, 17 of them, actually. If you go into Acts chapter 2 and count up the nations, there are 17. And we have to remember that the practice of encoding numbers and names, called gematria, was common in the ancient world. They, they found a little bit of graffiti uh, in, in Pompeii, in the volcanic ruins. Uh, and some poor chump had written, I love her whose number is, and uh, wrote her number. And it wasn't her phone number. It was the number of her name. In our system, we have Roman letters and Arabic numerals. So if you're doing maths, you have one set of symbols. And uh, if you're writing a name, you have another set of symbols. Well, in Latin and Greek and Hebrew, they didn't do it that way. Their letters were their numbers, and their numbers were their letters. So you could look at someone's uh, name, and you could, you could read it, say, Andrew. Uh, or you could read A is a 1, N is whatever that would be, D is a 4, and so on. And you'd see a, a row of numbers, and it would be the easiest thing in the world to say, uh, for example, this guy who loves Julia or something, if he says, I love Julia, <clears throat> um, and he gives the number, that's simply the sum of the different numerals in her name, the, the numbers of the, the numerical values of the letters of her name. So that was very common. For example, uh, Suetonius tells us about a little bit of doggerel poetry that was circulating in Rome about Nero. Uh, because Nero was an awful person and he murdered his mother at, at one point. And someone pointed out that the numerical value of Nero's name and the numerical value of murdered his mother uh, were the same number. And somebody figured that out and wrote a little poem about it. And that's what they did instead of the internet back then. So it was a very common thing. It's esoteric to us. It's really weird to us, but it was very common for them. And they could do it in a way that we cannot because of the way their letters and numbers worked. So in Hebrew, the first nine letters corresponded to one through nine. The next nine were 10 through 90, and the last five were 100 through 400. <clears throat> now, one biblical scholar has noted that the prophet Ezekiel promised that at the time of the New Covenant uh, would be a time of glorious fishing. In Ezekiel 47, it says, Fishermen will stand beside the sea. From Engedi to Eglaim, it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. So Ezekiel prophesied this time. Now, Ezekiel 47 is the chapter where the living waters flow out from the threshold of the temple. Remember, John wrote the book of Revelation, and Revelation is steeped in imagery taken from Ezekiel. The book of Revelation is a New Testament Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel is an Old Testament Revelation. The New Jerusalem at the end of the book of Revelation is the temple that Ezekiel gives us, and they do the same things. There are trees in the book of Revelation whose leaves are for the healing of the nations, and the same thing is in Ezekiel 47. So you have uh, the temple and living waters flowing out of the temple, and right past the threshold of the temple, it's a trickle. 
then it's ankle deep, and then it's knee deep, and then it's waist deep, and then it's too large to pass, and it goes out and it spreads out and it fills the whole world. And this living water goes down uh, to pass a bank where the fishes stand upon it. And it says there are fishermen standing there and they stand from En Gedi to En Eglaim. Uh, the, the prefix en simply means spring. Uh, not the season, but spring of water. And so there are two words that we should consider separately. Gedi and Eglaim. If we look at the numerical value of Gedi in Hebrew, we find that it is 17. And the value of Eglaim is 153. So in a passage in Ezekiel that's talking about the same thing that John is talking about in John chapter 21, you have two springs and fishes of men standing all the way from one spring to the other. So try reading Ezekiel 47 with this living water from the temple of the church, trees on both sides of the river with leaves for medicine for the healing of the nations. And we see how fishes of men are standing there from the spring of 17 to the spring of 153. That's what Ezekiel tells us. From the spring of 17 to the spring of 153. And then Jesus comes, appears on the beach and says, bring the fish boys and they haul it in. Let's make a special point of counting them. Why would we do that? Well, because they knew their Old Testament better than we do. Ezekiel was talking about the salvation of the Gentiles under the figure of fish, and he uses these numbers. John refers to this, and it has the same meaning as the explicit meaning given to it by Jesus. In Luke, Jesus had said, I will make you fishers of men. That means that 153 is a symbolic number for the Gentile nations that will be brought into the kingdom of God. And that is why you are here today. That's why you are here. God is continuing to fulfill his covenant promise that he gave through his prophet Ezekiel and through all the other prophets. But through Ezekiel, he had said, I'm going to be kind to all the nations of men. He told Abraham that through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. There's more to it, though. Remember that this is the occasion of Peter being restored. Peter is being restored to ministry. You might say, well, Jesus has risen, and Peter had seen him before back in Jerusalem. Peter had seen the risen Lord. But there's a problem. Christ has risen is good news, right? Generally speaking, Christ is risen is good news. But not for Caiaphas, right? Not for Caiaphas, not for Judas, not for Pilate. Christ has risen, but that's not good news for Judas. Now, what's Peter's status? The blasphemer. Peter, the blusterer. Peter, the one who happened to be in the upper room when Jesus appeared. Yes, Jesus has risen, but Peter still doesn't know. Is this good news or bad news? It's good news generally that Jesus rose from the dead. Christ has triumphed. But Peter doesn't know if he's going to fall the way that Judas fell. He doesn't know if he's going to be rejected. Peter is still twisting in the wind. Peter is not restored until this time. And this is a few weeks after the resurrection. And Pentecost is still a month or two in the future. So the antithesis is very clear here. The charcoal fire built by the enemies of Christ is really not a good place to warm yourself. And it ends with snarling, cursing, devouring bitterness and tears. The charcoal fire built by Christ is built in order to feed his disciples. When they come in, there's fish already on the fire. And then Jesus says, come and bring some of the fish that you've caught. And then as Peter is being restored in this glorious episode, he's commanded in his turn to feed the Christians who will follow him. I'm feeding you, you feed them. Post-resurrection, the Lord who feeds his disciples is as humble as he was in the upper room 
when he washed their feet before his death. The resurrected Lord who has triumphed over death and hell. He's triumphed over everything. He's still humble. They come in and he's built the fire already. There are fish on it already and he says, how do you want your eggs? Who's the cook? Jesus is the cook. Jesus is the one who prepared this for them. The risen Lord is standing there on the beach with sand in his sandals, preparing, serving his disciples. And then he says, and I want you to do the same for the people that are following you. Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. The resurrected Christ forgives and feeds. Our responsibility is to be forgiven and to be fed. And then to forgive and feed. The first charcoal fire is the fire of betrayal, treason, sin, blasphemies, crashing pride and humiliation. This is something that every last one of us needs. We all need to have it come crashing down. We all need to collapse like Peter did. We all need for the wheels to come off just like they did for Peter. Everybody needs this because it's the case. Whether we recognize it or not, this is the condition that we're in. So the first charcoal fire is the fire of betrayal, treason, sin, blasphemies, crashing pride and humiliation. The second fire is the fire of free and full forgiveness, a fire of complete reconciliation. Think about it this way. After Peter denied the Lord and he went out, it says after it had all dawned on him what he had done, he went out to weep bitterly. Peter goes out and he weeps bitterly over it. After that happened, how many times do you think that Peter wished he could do everything over? Jesus warned me. I was puffed up. I was proud. I thought I could do it myself. I'm 10 feet tall and bulletproof. I'm the Apostle Peter. How many, how many times do you think Peter, in a week or two since the resurrection of Christ, how many times do you think he lamented his self-confidence and bluster? How many times do you think he wished he could go right back again to the beginning of his discipleship and follow Christ faithfully this time? I wouldn't follow in pride this time. I wouldn't argue with the others on the road about who is the greatest. I would follow him the way that he was saying to follow him this time, which was in humility. I would follow him, truly follow him, not just externally follow him. How many times do you think he wanted a do-over? And what does Jesus give him? In the miracle of the fish, this is exactly what he gives to Peter. He takes him back to the moment when he was first called and is so gracious. And Peter is graciously given an unspeakable gift. Here, Follow me again. All is forgiven. This really is a do-over. Come, follow me. Do you see what's happening? When Peter was first called, he was called from his nets. He was called from the fishing boat. He was called from where he was. And now three years later, and a lot of emotional churn and blasphemy and pride and everything coming apart, Peter is right back where he started. And Jesus comes to him right where he was. And Jesus does the same thing. He says, let down your net. Take in the fish. Come, follow me. This really is a do-over. This is the whole point. You say, I've wrecked everything. Well, so did Peter. What have you wrecked that Peter didn't wreck? What have you messed up? that Peter didn't mess up? How have you failed in a way that Peter didn't fail? Think about it. There isn't anybody in the world who can say that Peter's example is no encouragement to me. Everybody in the world, if they're honest with themselves, would say, I'm not where I should have been. I failed in different ways. I have face planted in different ways. I've sinned in different ways. I've sinned against light. I've sinned when I was warned not to. I'm a mess. I'm a piece of work. 
What about Peter? Do any of us need this kind of experience? Do any of us need this kind of reconciliation? The answer is yes, for everybody here. The Lord is not more gracious to Peter than he is to you. The Lord is not more gracious to Peter than he is to you. Do not ask about Peter what Peter asked about John. You'll get the same answer. What is that to you? You follow me. Well, I bet there are differences. Peter was an apostle. I bet Peter straightened up and flew right after this. Well, mostly. Peter was a great and good and godly apostle. But at the beginning of Acts, he has the sheet lowered to him three times. <clears throat> what is it with three in Peter? Three denials, uh, three affirmations of love, three restorations, and then on the roof of the house, the lowered sheet with the unclean animals representing the same Gentiles that these fish here represented. And the sheet is lowered three times, and Peter's saying, no, 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 I've, I've never, no, no. Three times. Peter was still in this world. Peter stumbled after this restoration. We know in the book of Galatians that, that Paul rebuked him to his face because he had succumbed to pressure from the Judaizers. And Paul had to say, Peter, that's not right. You're not doing right. And Peter receives the rebuke and he stands up at the Council of Jerusalem and he represents the good guys. Peter is not sinlessly perfect after this moment. He's restored after this moment. And the thing that's gone is the pride and the bluster. And our problem is that we, we want to be restored, but we want to keep the pride and the bluster. You can be restored. You can be forgiven. You can have your do-over. It's free and clear. It's here. It's yours. You can have that, but not with the pride and the bluster. This is a situation where you are summoned, you are called, and you can be received. You can follow Jesus as though you had never denied him. You can follow Jesus as though you had never denied him. And you say, but I have denied him, and I have stumbled, and I have sinned. And Jesus says, I died, I was buried, I rose again for that also. There's no sin that has you, there's nothing that can hold you if Jesus Christ is your Lord. If Jesus Christ is your Saviour, if Jesus Christ has done for you what he did for Peter, then everything is square. Everything is right. Everything is clean. Everything is perfect. And when you go up into heaven to pray to God, it's as though Jesus Christ himself were walking to the throne room of God to present this petition. That's what in Jesus' name, Amen, means. I'm here in Jesus Christ. I'm here because of him. I'm here because he is perfect. And God, when you look at me, you see the perfections of Jesus. When you look at me when I pray to you, even when I'm confessing sin, you receive it as though it were uh, offered by a perfect penitent. He is offering up that prayer of confession. And that's what Jesus gives to Peter, in effect. And this is the sum and substance of it all. Jesus gives himself to Peter. <clears throat> when the angels appeared earlier, they said, go, go and tell the disciples. And they say, and Peter, make sure you tell Peter. You see, Jesus loved Peter. Peter loved Jesus. Peter loved Jesus imperfectly. Jesus loved Peter perfectly. And Jesus loves you perfectly. Jesus loves you just right. He doesn't love you as a sort of an approximation. He doesn't love you as a theological category. He doesn't love you as a generic theological attribute. He loves you first name, middle name, last name, and all the warts. He loves you, and he restores you, and he summons you to come and follow him. That's what he's up to. That's what he's doing. This is the whole point. 
And this is why it's good news indeed that Christ has risen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we thank you. We ask you now, most gracious God, Father of Jesus Christ, we ask you to quicken us, to stir us up, and to give us a fervent zeal to spread the gospel of the risen Christ. And Father, we pray that we would tell not only uh, about the fact of the Lord's resurrection, but also what this means, that every per person who hears the words of this good message is being invited to start over. Amen.